Right, so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this event about serving on boards in different sectors. I'm Penny. I'm from a charity called Getting On Board, which specialises in charity trusteeships. And although, you know, that's our interest area, I'm completely fascinated by this topic. And I've been really, really looking forward to this event and to hearing about how um, being on a board in different sectors might differ. So this is how we're going to run the event. Um, I'm shortly going to pass over to Daush and Humza, who's going to talk to us about why sometimes charity trusteeship is seen as the poor relation to holding board positions in other sectors. We've then got an absolutely fantastic panel. Um, I'm really excited to hear from the panel. They've all been on multiple boards in lots of different sectors to hear about their reflections of how different sectors are different. We are aiming to finish for half past one. Um, and then at half past one, we are then moving into breakout rooms for anybody that wants to stay with us. That's completely optional. And the breakout rooms are about securing board positions. So we've got one about acquiring your first trustee position, one about moving on to larger charity boards, and one about commercial um, non-executive directorships. Um, and thank you to Daushan and Michael Considine who are providing those uh, breakout rooms alongside me as well. And I'll explain more about the breakout rooms as we get to half past one. So a couple of bits of housekeeping. Uh, we are recording, so if you don't want to be recorded, please turn off your video and audio. Otherwise, we would love to see you because it's much nicer to talk to um, smiling faces than it is to talk to, talk to blank profiles. Um, we've got you all on mute as you arrive, and please do keep yourself on mute unless we've come to you for a question or a comment. That just helps um, keep feedback to a minimum. We are, however, fully expecting the event to be interactive. Please feel free to use the chat very actively to introduce yourselves, to ask questions of Daushin and the panel, um, and also to share your own experiences, tips, comments. Um, we, we always find that an active chat is actually makes for a better event, so please feel free to use it. So I am now going to pass over to Daushin, and Daushin, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself before you get going, please. Many thanks um, to Penny and obviously the Getting On Board team for pulling this together. Um, it, has, it shows the, the level of interest when we look at questions that were submitted beforehand online and directly to many of us in the, the broader topic here of the similarities and differences of boards in various sectors, namely private sector, public sector, um, civil society and focusing on the charity sector, but also the perception of the sector we're focusing on charity compared to the rest of civil society, public and the private sector. So as a quick introduction, I'm Daushan Hamza. I'm broadly, you could say, an independent board director and strategic advisor. I work across a number of boards and have a number of clients in my advisory and consulting business, a number of boards in civil society, and charity, and a number of boards in the private sector as well. My focus has been through my executive career, through to my non-exec career and portfolio career, has been business transformation or transformative growth, digital innovation and talent quality. Um, that's all served with a dose of, let's say, oblique thinking, creative thinking, and being a bit more of a maverick. It's not like a typical board director um, by any stretch of the imagination. But this is a topic that's very, very close to me. And it is the perception that many have of the, the charity sector. So I'm going to flirt between the title that Penny gave us there and more broadly addressing some of those perception issues. I think when we look at boards across different sectors, there's actually more similarity than difference. We can look at an executive role and focus in the specific functional capabilities or the skill set required. But when we step out of the executive into the non-executive, whether it is a non-executive board in the private sector, a governing body of an academic institution, um, a board of directors in the NHS under a trust, or a board of trustees for the charity sector. There's a lot more similarity there. The overall perspective and the difference of an exec versus a non-exec comes down to that separation of roles, moving away from the day-to-day -day through to the governance aspects. And then I'll come to this shortly, for what I call the four eyes model for board directors. The similarities don't just start, stop there. We have a lot of similarities in terms of that there isn't much of a hurdle to be a board director. And I do say this flippantly, Mickey or Minnie Mouse could be a board director, as long as they're not disqualified. If they can add perspective, levels of experience, a different viewpoint, 
you're pretty much meeting the guys is there for being a board director. So no, you don't need a formal qualification, but of course you mustn't be disqualified. Now this lack of formal qualification is both good and bad. Good, it should open the door to the many. Bad, we have no standards. But actually we haven't really opened the door to the many. Board directorships, be they in private sector, public sector or trusteeships, are still seen as a realm of the few and the privileged privileged by background and privileged by other, let's say, protected characteristics. And what we do have then is a challenge of groupthink. So the board doesn't necessarily serve its purpose of challenging the exec, of stretching the organization, and of providing diverse viewpoints. At worst, it could be like a coffee morning or coffee afternoon. At best, you have, let's go with the flow and you're not ready for anything that comes on the, on the horizon, whether it's digital disruption, inequality, or something like a pandemic. So many of our boards, in my view, are not fit for purpose. So now let's try and drill down into this, Penny was talking about the similarities and differences. We can look at a, a public sector board, and let me start there. Many people look at a public sector board and go, of course, you have the Nolan principles of public life. I think there are seven. I shouldn't have said that because I can see as a question saying one of the seven. Um, so if anyone's quicker than me on Google, go for it. But I think those principles of known as principles of public life are um, leadership, openness, honesty, objectivity, accountability, selflessness and integrity. I think that's seven. Um, if there's a, you've got a bonus there as well. But those principles that we talk about as principles of public life and public office and those serving on public sector boards are actually consistent with what you would expect in private sector, civil society and charities. So it's a common set of principles that should be applied across all boards rather than just being stated as the seven principles of public life as defined by Nolan. The difference comes under probably more the compliance regime um, Justine, thank you. I think I got two, four, yep, I got the seven, full house bingo. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it, Justine. Um, but the, the differences come under your regulatory regime. So for example, those of us who serve as trustees in the charity sector may be governed by companies law, and also obviously the charities commission. And we have a more rigorous form of governance on us as directors. Those of us who served in the private sector would be covered under the company's law, but those in regulated businesses, such as finance, insurance, would be covered under regulation by the FCA. We would have to pass a director's test under the FCA. Um, for those who are lucky to serve on a, on a premiership football board, you'll have a director's and owner's test as well. But if you're an owner, you probably wouldn't be on this call. Um, you'd be owning the platform, probably. So there are differences in terms of eligibility. But in terms of the actual focus of a director, they're actually very similar. We've said no qualifications. And I did mention something called the four eyes of board governance. This is the similarities for me, or these are the similarities for me. And the four eyes, we'll start with the basic. The first eye is that of oversight. And oversight covers the aspects of governance, compliance, finance, and strategy. That's generally a given for a board, regardless of sector. All boards should be providing that um, to the organizations that they're serving. But where's the magic in that? We have rules that govern compliance, that govern finance. We have generally models that we work to on strategy. The magic comes when you get the second and third eye. Now, if you focus on that first eye, the eye of oversight, generally you find we go straight to the fourth eye and that's hindsight. And we don't really wanna be there, but actually most boards operate in that fashion. We have our risk registers, we have oversight, and oh dear, this has happened, we haven't prepared. Or we don't look inwardly enough to the skills we have around the table, or we don't look outwards to the provocations and the possibilities that exist there and we lack that imagination or what I call that more right brain, creative, oblique approach. So we go to hindsight. 
The second and third eyes, I think, are absolutely critical across sectors, but more so within civil society and for leaders of charities and voluntary organisations. And that is the eye of insight and the eye of foresight. Now, I'm not asking anyone to be mystic Meg here on foresight, but what I'm expecting of directors across sector is the bread and butter of oversight, governance, compliance, finance, strategy, and then the magic of insight brought in through their own diverse experiences, executive experiences, youthfulness, age, background, perspective, different thinking. And the benefits of the third eye, of foresight, where you can scenario plan, you can get insight from those whom you serve, be it your customers, your patients, your students, the communities you serve, you can take those insights and then bring in some inspiration. So we build scenarios about what could be, what could happen, what if, and the what if questions we should be asking more. These are common across all boards. Now, obviously, I have a view that we don't do that well enough in the UK, particularly insight and foresight. And when we look at particularly our charity boards, we actually find, and I'm talking now of the larger charities, the, let's say, if I was to compare the top 100 charities by the funds they receive versus, or the income they generate versus the FTSE 100 or some of the large public sector bodies, you would find the makeup, and we know this, um, three researchers published the makeup of these boards in the charity sector are less diverse on gender, ethnicity, and definitely on social background. And the one that is even harder to measure, thinking styles. We have, and I did see a comment um, in the chat about qualified folk. Um, you've got the smaller businesses. I think Mark Kightley had talked about accountants, lawyers, doctors, dentists, um, trades folk who are qualified and are company directors of their own companies. But in our larger companies, we do find an overabundance of qualified accountants and lawyers. People are thinking in a very linear, rational, left brain fashion. But we don't get the magic of more creative, oblique thinking that we need across all of these sectors. There is no qualification to be creative, to be oblique, to be right brain. A lot of it does come down to the chair, the SID, the senior independent director, and others around that table to draw that thinking out, to value it, and to be able to manage and cope with uncertainty. So if I now extend this to the charity sector and how the charity sector is perceived, I often get asked a question, and I'm sure this, I know this question has been provided already, and we may discuss it in some of the breakout rooms, how do I become a, a board director? How do I become a non-exec? How do I serve on the board of a large private sector company? And you hear the cliche answer, just be a school governor, serve on a charity board. It's said with a degree of disdain that absolutely pisses me off. Serving as a school governor, I served as a school governor, um, I have great hair, I can say this now, in the last millennium, I love saying that back in 1998, um, was bloody hard. And it's not just about discipline panels and pupil panels and teacher assessments. You have a school going through special measures and you're responsible for turning that around. You're responsible for the leadership of that school. It is not a comic side gig, it's a serious role. Serving on the board of a charity, be it you know, let's say our largest charity in the UK is Cancer Research UK, or the thousands, tens of thousands of smaller charities is a significant responsibility. You have legal responsibilities. You're covered under a director's and officer's insurance liability generally, or hopefully you are. Um, and you're governed by, obviously, a couple of regimes, including the Charities Commission. That is a serious responsibility. It is not to be treated as a joke or to be seen as a stepping stone. Yes, it can help you. It can support your executive career. It might open the door to other potential directorships. But if I reverse it and look at the boards of the top 100 charities, the vast majority of board directors who have in the top 100 charities, the largest 100 charities, 
have actually had the stepping stone of a private sector board. Sometimes you have to invert it to appreciate the difference and value where you are. A lot of the perceptions we have of the charity sector actually are governed by the systems we have in place. And particularly in the UK, we tend to look at an elite university education as elite, a university education as elite. And we forget about vocational education compared to other nations. When we look at the charity sectors, I come back to a, a principle of mine. And one, the, one of the core principles I have um, that I've used throughout my life, three words, succeed, serve, and share. I can succeed professionally. I can succeed with the organizations I serve, but equally I can share the skills that I have, the experiences that I have, and I can serve those organizations succeed, serve, and share. Serving and share is not just a preserve of the charity sector. It is generally seen as a higher goal, it's a higher purpose. You've probably seen the, the studies where nurses have spoken to people as they're, they're on their, their last legs and they ask about their wishes. And you generally hear, you could have spent more time with family, wish I could have traveled more, wish I could have given more wish I could have been involved in my community more. Why wait to the end? <laughs> it's such an important thing, and yet we don't value it. So the perception of the charity sector actually starts early on. We do a lot of work. One organization does a lot of work in schools. And the amount of careers departments we see where they talk about some of the professions that um, I think Mark had put up there in the chat, where they talk about the sectors of finance, banking, of entertainment, but they don't talk about charities as a viable career option for a 16 year old, an 18 year old, somebody leaving further education or higher education. It's rarely mentioned as a career path. And even later on in life for many folk, it's rarely mentioned as a sector that you could move into. And we know that there are aspects of perception and that starts off set at school. We don't see it as a career option. In terms of serving on a board or working in the sector, we may characterize pay with prestige, but the masters of the universe are no longer, sorry if we've got any bankers here, it's not Goldman Sachs. We learned during the pandemic who the masters and the mistresses of the universe are. They're those that serve us, they're those that kept us going. And whether that was those in civil society, in the charities that were so much in demand then and now, those that were doing our everyday chores of maintaining our streets, serving our shops, getting our posts delivered, getting our food delivered, serving the communities that were underestimated by whatever characteristic or condition. We know who we value. And it's that narrative that we need to change in the charity sector, that this is a sector that should be shone upon and not looked down upon. This is a sector that should be drawing talent at an entry level, at, an, at a managerial level, at an executive level, at a board level. So there is much in the sector for us to be proud of in the charity sector. There is much that we can give to the private sector and the public sector. Equally, there is much that we can learn from those sectors as well. But in terms of the core question here of board directors, similarities and differences, if I were to put a number on it, I could say 80% of roles across these three sectors are similar. The nuance may be where you need somebody who's financially qualified or qualified under the FCA, or you need a specific skill relevant to that sector, if it be in healthcare or somewhere else. But a board is not one person, although you do have the independence of the smaller companies, it's a collective. So you have a collective set of skills. So you can always recruit for that diverse talent and that broad experience. Hence, I'd say, going back and closing on my four eyes of um, board uh, behavior model, board, board um, aspect model, oversight, insight, foresight, and always keep the last one the back, the hindsight, if you don't do two and three right. 80% of that is common across all of these sectors. 
And that's the magic we need to draw upon, but value the difference between insight and foresight and use that to spread learning across sectors and really expose creative thinking in our boardrooms. So I think that gives um, about 10 minutes and um, Penny, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Doubt, and lots of food for thought there and some challenges which others might want to disagree with. Let's see. Um, so let's move into our panel. We've got Gurpreet Dayhal, Sarah Pierman, Jane Ide, and Daushan Humza as well. I'm going to ask panellists to introduce themselves in a sec, but just to say, audience, please do ask questions in the chat, add in your own experiences and reflections. Thank you, Sophie. We've immediately got a question from Sophie. She was obviously poised. Um, so panellists, if you could please Briefly introduce yourself, and Daush, and I won't ask you to reintroduce yourself. So let's go to Jane, if you could introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Penny, and hello, everybody. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, my name's Jane Ide. I'm the chief exec, relatively recently arrived chief executive of Akivo, which, if you don't know us, is the Association of Chief Executives in Voluntary Organisations. So um, we have a strong professional interest in. The relationship and the governance uh, uh, relationship within the charity sector for obvious reasons. Um, from a personal point of view, I am, I just had to jot it all back down again to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I am a charity chief executive and have been in three organisations over the last five years. I am also a trustee and I am about to step into my first role as a charity chair. So that's my charity governance hat on both sides of the table. Um, I have been uh, in the past and not that long ago, a non-executive director in an NHS trust, although not a foundation trust, so we didn't have governors. So that's a whole other different difference that there is. Um, and a long time ago, I was an executive director in, a, in an NHS trust just in the early days of becoming a trust. So that whole process of understanding the governance. I have been, uh, again, in a previous role, an executive director on the board of an arm's length body of government, government, which is a whole other world again, um, the balance between executive and non-exec, very different there. And finally, I think this is the last one of my hats to wear. I am a governor and currently chair of governors uh, for a small local primary school. So I've got, yeah, uh, yeah, some variety there, shall we say, in the way that the, the similarities and the differences between the different governance models. Thank you, Jane. I guess our challenge is going to be to stick within our hour with all of these board <laughs> positions to run through. Right, yes. um, <laughs> Gurpreet, let's come to you next. Could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Gurpreet Deha. Um, I'm, I'm smiling a bit uh, when I was listening to Dashan's summary. Uh, so I am, by training, uh, an investment banker and risk manager um, for about 30 odd years. And then in 2010, I saw an ad for a university governance position. And I thought, oh, I wonder what this is. It might be interesting and gave it a shot and loved it. And it was quite different to anything I'd ever done. So uh, a few years later, I thought there might be other roles a bit like this. So since 2014, I've been doing a variety of, of non-exec roles in financial services, uh, in the NHS, across schools, trusts, across infrastructure organizations, um, a whole range of things. Um, Charity work, corporate directorship, and you know private private sector work. And the one the one message I would pass to everybody is that switching from that exec role to the various board roles, um, it it really is about perspective and shared perspective on those boards and committees. We haven't mentioned committees yet, but committees are a very important thing as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Penny. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I'm Sarah Pierman. Um, I'm the CEO of Dynamic Boards. And if you haven't heard of us, we advertise all the non-executive director roles across the UK. Um, and I set that up because I, I became a non-exec um, on the board of a specialist bank when I was 29. And I was on the board of a charity when I was 26. And I've been on two other boards as a non-exec since. And my frustration was with, and then Dart and touched on this, you know, how inclusive is this market? Um, is it just people introducing each other at golf clubs? And that kind of thing that is, that's not an acceptable way to be finding board roles i believe in really good rigorous processes that not only get a diverse board but get a mix of skills and experiences ages all sorts so um that's why having got to know the market i got really frustrated that there was lots of websites that charge you money to view board roles uh, so i launched dynamic boards to make it free for everyone to look at roles so we post about a thousand roles a year 
Uh, there's generally 70 to 100 live roles any one time. Um, and I'm really passionate about making this a more inclusive market. Um, I'm happy in questions to, to answer how I found the differences between a charity trustee role and uh, the bank. I've so, sort of had a mix here. I've been on the board of a mutual, a franchise organisation, a private sector company and a charity. Within that, that's a bank, a home care provider, a financial services technology provider and a youth work organisation. <laughs> so uh, there's quite a mix there um, and look forward to this discussion. Thank you. And yeah, we're definitely going to be digging into those differences. Um, and Gurpreet and Sarah, you both talked a bit about kind of becoming a non-executive director. And Gurpreet, you talked about actively applying for a position. Jane, how did you get going with your positions? Was it something that was intentional or did it just happen? Did somebody ask you? Um, no, I think I think I've been fortunate that in each case it has been intentional. And I do think there is across the charity sector, there is a huge issue, particularly for those smaller local charities in terms of how you intentionally attract uh, board members, but perhaps we can touch on that in a moment. So I think for me, um, on the non-executive side, my, my, my first non-executive role was in the NHS, and that actually came about through the scheme that the NHS was, and I believe still is running, which was the Next Director Scheme, which was specifically and deliberately um, designed to bring in more diverse candidates into uh, NHS boards and it came about because actually I was approached by them to share the information of the scheme through our networks in in one of my previous uh, roles in the charity sector and in the process of doing that I found myself kept having conversations with them and eventually said you're running this and, and they were particularly focusing on women in the Midlands that was the thing they were looking at at the time and I said actually I'm a woman and I'm in the Midlands is this something perhaps I should look at and they said oh yes you know do um, and so that was how I actually stepped into my first role in the in the uh, NHS, which then became a formal associate director role um, on the board. Thank you. And Daushan, how did you get started with your board roles? Well, let's just go back um, to when I had hair or black hair, sort of 1998, <laughs> when I served on a um, James talk, big James talk about chairing a primary school, when I served on the board of a, a failing primary school that was about to be run by Bob the Builder. It's when Atkins were crazily given contracts to um, turn around the schools. Interesting, because I believe in diversity, so I'm sure schools could learn a lot from a building, building firm provider. Um, luckily, the school that I served on didn't go down a special measures route um, fully, and we, we got it out of there over a course of three, four years. I was attracted, I'll go back to the principles, succeed, serve, and share. So we're talking 1998. Everyone's talking about diversity and board positions today. This is 1998. You know, it was before Prince did 1999. So it was a different world. The principles guide me. It was to serve, and it was to serve that local primary school. I was in, um, I was a lot younger, obviously. You can do the math. But I was a lot younger. And I didn't know what a board director role meant or a government role meant. But it attracted me to serve. And as I post that benefited also in my executive career I became aware of board roles I was working closely with the boards in, in the private sector that I was in um, and the organizations I served and soon after leaving my last formal exec role I then moved into a portfolio career but the concept was always down to principle succeed serve and share and I guess another s word serendipity um, and that brought me into the board world and serving a number of organizations. So there's not, there are a lot of information now, there's a lot of insight now, but in the late nineties, it was very different. And we're talking about diversity of board directors now. It wasn't a consideration for me as somebody who was different on, you know, many counts, social background, et cetera, et cetera. We're talking about it now, we haven't made much, much progress um, to Sarah's point. So that's how I became aware. And I guess, I think Jane, you spoke about the next scheme that the NHS runs, which is excellent. And we, or one of my organizations, Board Apprentice, worked with the NHS before that to share how we were bringing in apprentices, which is a disservice to the very senior person who is the apprentice, when you take the British term apprentice, but the very senior exec, any of us on this call, for example, as an observer on a board and how we expose that individual to one of Sarah's challenges, 
to the networks of those existing boards, there's nothing wrong with a tap on the shoulder. Just tap me on the shoulder and I'll expose you to my network. Tap people who don't play golf. I don't play golf. Yeah. So there are other ways. You've got to broaden the, the net that you focus on. So that's how I got involved and I just digressed a little. Thank you. And we're going to come back actually to some, know, yeah. you know, some thoughts on the recruitment mechanisms for different sectors, which I'm sure Sarah yeah. is de desperate to talk about as well. Sarah, I want to come to you now. So what have you seen in terms of the differences between boards in different sectors, in terms of serving as a board member in different sectors? Yeah, so kind of linked to that last question, when I joined the board of a charity, I already knew um, the CEO of the charity and um, they tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you be interested in becoming trustee? But for my other three board roles, which are all paid non-exec roles, um, I applied and I knew no one on each of the boards before I joined the board. And I don't know how telling that is. It's not a great poll uh, because I've only had those four roles. But actually, um, I think it is important that trustee roles have the same rigour um, as uh, as someone else is just saying is it illegal to be doing that. This was I mean, this is eight years ago so and, and I'm not aware if it was but I do think it's very bad practice um, to recruit like that and trustees need to go through rigorous processes and advertising is a key way to make sure that you can run a good process um, so yeah even as I came in the door those roles were different um, I saw personally I was on the board of a, a smaller charity and often governance is a challenge in those settings um, I was on a board with and I'm sure lots of you have experienced this, what I would call some trophy assets. So people that they wanted to have on the board because it makes the board look like the kind of board that you should be uh, giving a lot of money to. It helps their um, fundraising that they have some high profile people on the board. And one of my passions for charities now is that you have ambassadors and patrons that do that kind of role for you. But actually, the people that are going to be there for your regular board meetings to make governance decisions for that organisation need to be good at governance and they need to have the time and the attention and the will to get involved in whatever matters are necessary to make those good decisions. And so I really passionately believe what Dalton said, this is not a springboard to something else. It's not something to make you look good. Uh, that you do you need to be on those boards because you passionately believe in that organization having good governance and you think that you have some skills to bring you don't need to think you're the most senior executive in the world and you're ticking all those boxes but you need to believe you've got skills to bring to help make that happen thank you um Gurpri, what differences have you seen in different sectors and what causes the differences do you think so I, I guess I'd probably start with sort of reflecting on the the eighty percent similarity model that, that Darshan talked about. You know, I, I would very much be in that camp. So you know, therefore, the twenty percent of difference is what what does that really mean? So a couple of things up for me. One is, you know, organisations need different things from their boards. You know, there are there are some things you have to have um, because you have director responsibilities, because you may be signing off accounts, etc. But they they might need insight on strategy a little more, or they might need support for executive, or they might need um, a more strategic local area. So there are different needs. So that's one thing I, I, I do see a little different. In a corporate board, that need I've certainly experienced less of, and of course it's about shareholder value and the product and the client and so on. So that's one difference I'd bring out. Um, perhaps the second one, uh, I, I don't see any difference in thinking of the, the, the role at a charity or a private sector or a government non-departmental body that Jane mentioned. That, you know, the, the, the rigor, the responsibility you have, the, the need to show up to be there. You know, Sarah really made some excellent points, I thought. You know, there is something around a celebrity board versus a doing board. Um, you know, doing boards do and govern and celebrity boards quite often don't. <laughs> um, because they're busy being celebrity, so they're being very frank, you know. So I think there's some, there's something there I would I would really highlight. Um, I do feel the perception of the stepping stone perception. I think colleagues have said it. You know, it's it's not true. It is not a stepping stone. It is a thing. It is a role. Um, it is one role that you have to do. Um, and if you want to do it, then you have to go and eyes open. And it's not a halfway house. Thank you. Um... Jane, so back back to similarities and differences. Would you agree with Gurpri and Dauschen that there, you know, that there are many, many more similarities than there are differences? I would in very many ways, and I think the similarities that I see across the different 
um, governance models that I've worked in are very much about behaviours, commitment, that sense of you know what we're accountable for and 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 all of those underpinning pieces but the one big difference that i don't think we touched on yet is the fundamental systemic structural differences across the different sectors so when i was um in that arm's length body of government i was one of six executive directors we had two non-executive directors and to be quite honest they had very little power very little um influence really they were there in all honesty, to tick a box that government could say, you know, this organisation is accountable to the public. Um, in the charity sector, uh, we have a very clear uh, distinction between the executive and the non-executive roles and what those roles are about. And it's it's absolutely, you know, set out in, in the regulatory frameworks. Um, and that, I think, creates a whole different dynamic. Uh, in the NHS, uh, I was part of a unitary board where the executive directors and the non-executive directors had equal um, authority, equal power, equal validity. Everybody had a vote. There was one more non-executive than there was executive on the board. And that was the only thing that gave that balance to non-executive um, authority, so to speak. And I have to say, I think having and, and working, working in all three of those, my personal preference is very much for that unitary board because I think that that sense of shared responsibility, shared accountability and a very healthy, you have to work hard on it to make that healthy relationship between executive and non-exec because whatever your experience going in as an executive into your board meeting is always slightly terrifying, um, you know, and there's no two ways around that, however good your, your relationships are with people. But I think that for me was, was really powerful. I think, um, and I'm conscious that I've got at least one of my own trustees in this, in this audience, which is, which is great. Um, lovely to see you here, Joyce. And I'm very fortunate, and I have been very fortunate that I have I've had excellent trustee boards to work with. But again, I know from working with a number of other charities across the sector of different sizes and different scales, and again, particularly those at the smaller end of the, the scale, there can be some really difficult challenges in that dynamic between the trustees who hold the legal and accountability responsibilities, but don't and should not hold that operational uh, in, involvement, but who don't necessarily really engage effectively with their executives or with their chief exec or senior management team or whoever it is. And the tensions and, and challenges and how that can then play out to the real detriment of that organization. And of course, ultimately, most importantly, the communities it's there to serve is is a is a big challenge big issue for us i think and it kind of flows into the stuff that sarah and darshan and, and gopri have been talking about in terms of particularly you know how do we recruit people how do we get people onto those trustee boards to understand just how important it is and then how when we've got them there how do we help them to thrive and make sure that they are able to do that job really well because if they don't and if if we don't get that right then there's a lot more impact than just a difficult board meeting Thank you. Loads of really interesting points, Jane. And Rowan has asked, I mean, there's loads of good questions in the chat as well. Uh, Rowan has asked a connected question, which I'm going to throw at Dowshin, which is, do you think it's helpful to learn from the structures and systems of governance in other sectors, or does each have, have its own special culture which needs to be protected? No, we definitely don't want protection. If you want protection, you want magic and difference to be protected. You want institutionalising listening to be protected. So you actually listen to the communities you serve. You listen to the diverse voices. And um, we don't listen to the 10 accountants or 10 investment bankers, sorry, Gertrude, in the room, but we value the difference in the room. So if you want things to be, it's a great question, Rona. Do you want things to be protected? Let's protect the things that should be protected. Difference, challenge. I have a lovely quote um, from a mentor of mine. Um, who, unfortunately, who unfortunately has passed, and it's his memorial of tomorrow. Um, and he used to say, he was one of the most promiscuous directors in the FTSE 100. And he used to say, we often recruit to challenge, but in the UK, we select to fit. Let's ponder on that for a minute. And unfortunately, it's, it is very much the case. So when you talk about what we can learn in terms of structure and systems, I think 
obviously there's a lot we can learn, but let's not just focus governance on that definition of the first I and the fourth I, oversight and hindsight. The magic of governance is when you bring in different perspectives, when you bring in challenging perspectives, when there is more discussion and debate around insight and foresight. I cannot sit around a table with 11 people, then I picked 11, probably a football team number here, but 11 folk who have similar views and similar experiences, or we're gonna sit through a series of presentations. I'd far value a discussion where we have completely diverse, oblique views, yes, working towards the same collective goal as a board, but to get there through active debate, discussion, challenge. So if we are gonna learn, absolutely. If we are gonna protect, protect the differences and protect valuing the differences, protect what I call institutionalizing listening, not the cliche, we're listening, but actually institutionalizing it. And I know institutionalizing is a bad word, but I use it deliberately because that's how you listen with empathy and how you act. That's what should be protected. That's good governance. You won't find that written in perhaps the FCA or the Charities Commission, but that's the spirit of good governance. And it's a spirit of good governance that needs to be protected. Thank you. Um, Joe Hensey, you've asked a really interesting question. Are you happy to unmute yourself and speak to it? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, <clears throat> thanks, panel. This is really insightful. Uh, just wanted to know um, the kind of differences between being um, a director outside of the charity sector from a, a perspective of resource and time commitments, if possible. And you said expectations in your question as yeah. well, which is a, a kind of an interesting question. And you also mentioned the, you know, the difference between paying or not paying. So does paying someone change those expectations? Really interesting question, Joe. Thank you. Um, Gurpreet, let's come to you on that one. Gosh, Joe, you're making me think now on that one. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to bring in the, the, the regulatory concept that, that Jane mentioned and, and maybe use two examples. So you know, under FCA regulation for financial firms, you know, when you sign off accounts or when you look at risk reports and so on, you know, if you don't do it properly, if you can't evidence that you've asked the right questions and got the right MI in the right forum, you can go to jail. Um, so there, um, you, you actually, as a, as a director, have responsibility, but the FCA expects a certain set of record keeping for seven years after you leave as well to make sure that things are wrong. So there, you know, there you, you, you would expect a return for your risk, your personal risk for doing the work. You spend more time on that perhaps than you would otherwise. So uh, that's one example of, you know, outside of the charity sector where there's a really thorny, bad outcome that one works very hard to, you know, to protect yourself. Um, another one, perhaps a little different, and, I, and I've been a regulator in the, uh, for universities. I've created a, helped create the regulatory framework for the English higher education system. And, and thinking as a regulator, what is it that we want university councils to do? And, and what is it we want them to, to ensure oversight and governance? Uh, so again, most universities are charities. Uh, so effectively, you're, you're regulating a charity as, as well as a charity commission doing that. There, you know, most, most, I think 10 universities pay their chairs, that, that sort of thing, um, out of 157. Um, there, there's a rigor. It's not as firm as the FCA type of rigor, but there is a rigor from that regulatory framework. So I hope I'm answered part of your question. You know, there's something around the regulatory requirement. There's something around the, the risk that one takes that reflects the reward. And Gurpreet, so FCA, Financial Conduct Authority, did you say MI? Uh, management information. Sorry, right. the, okay. sorry to throw oh, the acronyms in. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no like, acronyms um, panel, not allowed. <laughs> a bit like Dashan talks about his three S's. Uh, for me, the three tend to be strategy for a board, MI to see what you're doing, and remember the headlights, not the tail lights. Nice, thank you. Um, Let's talk a bit about accessing board positions because there's a few questions on this and I know that this will be why some people are here. So Sarah, do you see a big difference in the accessibility of different positions between different sectors? Definitely. Um, so uh, charity trustee roles, currently um, 
many are advertised, many are not, and they still need to be working on that. But there are several places you can you can look for charity trustee roles, uh, like charity jobs, reach volunteering, and several other sites. Um, in terms of the paid non-exec roles, um, that's the area that I've been quite passionate about making sure we do have access for, so you can see them all on dynamic boards. But you can only see the ones that are advertised. We are attempting to encourage organisations to advertise their roles. I think it's going to take a long time to win them over. So very few listed companies advertise their roles. They generally use search firms and those search firms go out to very set networks. And uh, that means that you'll only ever hear about that role if you are known by that search firm. Then there's private sector organisations, so like family owned businesses that might ask their accountant and their accountant might suggest someone or might join the board. <laughs> We've got all sorts of poor governance happening in those kind of areas. So we'd love to see all sorts of organisations, including those sort of smaller family owned businesses, actually advertising for the role so that they get people that are totally fresh. They've never heard of them before. They've got some really great skills to bring and a totally different perspective and fresh thinking for their board. So we've done that already. We've worked with organizations like that that would never have previously been able to recruit in the way that they have done through us. And I absolutely loved it. That's probably the bit of my job that has excited me the most was seeing people get good governance that wouldn't have got it otherwise. Um, so then there's lots of organizations that have a regulatory obligation to advertise. Um, so housing associations always advertise their roles. Uh, NHS foundation trusts always advertise. Um, building societies tend to advertise, not 100%. Um, in the education sector, generally school governorships, um, it used to be called the School Governor One Stop Shop, someone will know what it's called now, um, but there's a, a site that shows all of them and all of the academies board roles as well. So I think it's improving, um, but there's still a long way to go. There's a lot of organisations still going through personal networks and that just isn't, isn't right. And interestingly, that, that that problem sits across all of the, well, mo most of the sectors we're talking about. I've just mm. asked in the chat some of the helpful organisations. One Stop Shop is now called Governors for Schools. I am yeah. absolutely 100% sure that my list is not complete. So if people attending know of other helpful organisations, please bring them in the chat to help everybody else. Um, Jane, I want to come to you about moving between different sectors, which you have done very successfully. And Pete in particular has asked in the chat about, so he's worked for a couple of environmental charities. So, you know, do you, is it difficult to move from a paid role in one sector to a board role in a different role in a different sector or to start in one sector as a board member then to move across into a board, a uh, different sector? Any top yeah. tips on that? I've, I've put a little bit in the chat on that anyway, just in case we didn't get to pick that up. But I think it's, I think for me, it's, it's actually very much um, a parallel with if you're wanting to apply for a paid job in a different sector or a different environment that you've been in. And I think the key thing is do not be shy about sharing with whoever it is you're applying to join just what you are going to bring to that organisation. Mm. So that's what they're looking for. Um, and yes, your experience may be in a very specific um, part of the world, whether it's a specific part of the charity sector and you're wanting to go into something different in the charity sector, or it may be that your experience is in the charity sector and you want to go into the NHS or a, a, a private sector organisation or whatever it is, whatever your ambition is, the key thing that any anybody recruiting that role, however formally or informally they're doing that recruitment, what they are interested in is what, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to help us achieve our goals as an organisation? And it really pays and if you know I think for many of us there's that sense of uh, modesty or insecurity or imposter syndrome and all those things that get in the way of us actually saying that if you don't feel that you're able to articulate it ask somebody else ask you know ask somebody who knows you well somebody who works with you somebody who in your family to help you articulate what it is that they think you will bring and then use that and and really build on that because i think the one of the really key things for me in any any good governance model and and i think very much part of what sarah's working on and so many others are working on in terms of actually making these roles more accessible for people in whichever sector they're in is our organizations all of which one way or other for, for 
you know, benefit of others in one shape or form. We'll always function better the more diversity we have of perspective, of thought, of experience around that table. So don't fall into that trap of thinking, I don't look like the people they've already got. That's the whole point. Be proud of the fact that you're bringing something different and really maximise on that, and but articulate it in a way that other people can then understand that they're going to get something valuable from that. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of really juicy questions that have come up in the chat to cover, and I'm aware we've got under 10 minutes, but before we get onto those two very juicy questions, Daushan, I just want to come to you and and what words of wisdom have you got about people thinking, you know, I'd like to be a board member, but I've no idea where to start. Like which sector, how do people work out which sector might suit them? Well, it's not just sector, it's, it's where you start. And we're often asked, I want to be a board director, what do I need? Do I need to do this qualification or that? Do I need to be a chartered director? Do I need to do this course or that course? The simple answer is no. <laughs> and the simple answer is no, is because there is no qualification required by the experience of written, the perspectives you've read, and obviously not being disqualified. But also, what is it you've read? And we often talk about diversity and we talk about physical characteristics, but often the diverse folk that are appointed are those who have turned left on a plane, regardless, or those that have come from the same professional backgrounds so who are already board directors. So even our gatekeepers and our recruiters are not doing a good enough job and our gatekeepers being those of us who are in positions of authority or recruiting ourselves, and those who we appoint to recruit are not doing a good enough job of championing true, I call it diversity of poets, perspective, outlook, experience, thought, sector and social background, or cognitive diversity to, to give it a more sort of easier um, moniker there. So I can, I can talk about the reality, I can talk about my belief and to be passionate about the area that you've read. And it might be representing a local community when we talk about NHS boards and housing association boards. It might be that you think in a certain way that would be attractive to a board where you could be challenging and bring a different perspective. It could be that you understand customer service fantastically well. That would apply to, I mean, Gerpeet was talking about Gerpreet was talking about academic boards. And I guess when you look at university boards and the, I think, the office for students now, having that end user perspective and that customer service perspective is critical. I may know nothing about students a long time ago when I was a student, but being passionate about customer service or a target audience would probably benefit one of those academic boards. So it's very easy for me to say, start with your area of passion your area of executive expertise, your area of standout, and then bring that to the board sector that you're passionate about. Somebody mentioned wildlife charities in the chat as well. And if there is a certain sector or certain force that is passionate, start there. Don't go for the cliched advice of find a small charity, find a primary school, find a multi-academy trust, because the reality is it probably won't get you to where you want to go. And that's a generalization, I know. But starting from your area of passion and building your own expertise, be it your executive, your full-time role, causes that you care about or things that make you different would mark you out. We need that more than ever now in a post-pandemic world, in a disrupted world where old models have been proven not to work old ways of thinking have been proven not to work. We need it more than ever now. So I say, be on your front foot and follow your passion, as opposed to the cliched advice we could all give you. Lovely, thank you. Um, right, we've still got our two juicy questions and we've got six minutes. So Stephen Richards in the audience, are you happy to unmute and ask your question? You're muted at the moment, Stephen. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for a really enlightening discussion. It was really about if one's on, the, on a board and one identifies poor performance or non-adherence to the principles. Now, bearing in mind, I, on that board, may be part of the problem. How do I constructively call it out? 
Lovely. Thank you, Stephen. I love the self-awareness about the fact that actually you might be part of the problem. So I'm going to come to Jane and Gurpreet, and if you could both make your answers pretty snappy, given our time constraints, that would be lovely. Jane? I thought you might, Penny. Thanks for that one. Um, I think, yeah, a very wise question, Stephen, and thank you for raising it. I would say in an ideal situation, you as a board will have processes and procedures in place to help you raise these questions. Whether you've actually got those formally written down or not, the first thing has to be having a conversation with your chair and raise it and raise it in the way that you feel will be most effective. I mean, if the chair is part of the problem as well, then obviously you have to find a tactful way of doing that. Um, but that's in an ideal situation, that's really what you've got to be able to do. And I think it's a sign of a healthy board that is able to have those conversations and almost by definition that may be part of the problem but but that's what I would I would start there um and certainly I would also say if you know if you if you are struggling then talk to Penny talk to you know the other organizations that are around to help navigate some of these problems and get some advice because you're not you won't be the first and you certainly won't be the only one and Gurpreet, what would you say to that? And is there an answer, you know, are there things you can learn from being on lots of boards and about how different boards might handle this situation? Uh, so a couple of things. So, you know, boards, boards have ups and downs and periods of times when things don't go particularly well and, and, and all of that. So I guess, Stephen, if we're talking about a consistent period where, you know, the, the two points I say, it, it's not about I, it's about we. I mean, Dasha made the point about collective responsibility. So, you know, it, it's about raising in a in the most appropriate way which could be with the chair could be with a senior independent director could be just at the right time on an agenda item about you know we aren't we're not looking at this the right way we might be looking at it this way and broadening it out you know that might be one option and then um the second thing i, I might say is you know the board effectiveness reviews which are scheduled and may or may not be scheduled in all organizations they they can often be um a little soft um you know i think we've all seen when people may be a little fearful of calling out certain items or the, you know, rate yourselves one to five. Well, one means it's really awful. I'm never going to score this as a one. So I, I think, you know, the, 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 the discussion is probably the, the better way to go. Can I just chuck in, and I'm sorry, Penny, because I know time, but I think Gurpreet's absolutely right there. And we've got to give a shout out. If, you, if we're talking about a charity, we've got to give a shout out to the charity Code of Governance. And there are some great tools out there. It, Encouraging your board to work through the code of governance in a self-reflective way can be a very safe way of starting to raise these issues without it being confrontational and giving people the chance to reflect. Um, and if you want to drop me an email, I can send you some details about tools and things that you might find helpful for that. Thank you. Right, wrapping up, because <laughs> we're at the end now, I'm just going to come to Dowshin and Sarah for final top tip a very quick tip at that for people sitting here thinking that they'd like to either get their first board role or they'd like to start to move into a different sector perhaps they're a board member in one sector and they want to move somewhere else sarah quick tip from you just start researching the adverts <laughs> i do think when you start looking through um non-exec adverts and they say what you're looking for you'll have a sense of whether it's something you can do um, so where it's easy, so use dynamic boards, use those other websites that um, Penny listed there, they're great. Um, start reading through adverts, read through the candidate packs, have a look at their website. And um, my feeling is don't spray and pray. Don't apply for tons of things <laughs> with the same CV, doesn't work. Um, really wait until you see an organisation that grips you and then try and really think through the value you bring and articulate that passionately in a cover letter. Lovely, don't spray and pray. I love that, I'm having it. <laughs> Dowshin, tip from you. I'm not gonna follow don't spray and play, play um, so that can take me somewhere where I want to go. I think the, um, I'm gonna move away from adverts because there's some lovely comments here in the chat. Um, I think somebody's talked about an advert saying three to four days a, a month. Reality was that's three to four days a week. So for me, the benefit, we, so I, I say we, these are collective we now, we've seen on board apprentice was not individuals learning through observation that was a benefit the biggest benefit they said was getting to know the existing board directors was being in their circles so the tip would certainly be to reach out to those maybe in your networks and even now with social media you can access wider folk 
I've had lots of direct requests come to me where people can find you online and ask about board roles, ask about where you serve, how you serve, be authentic to, for folk like me, be authentic, be decent enough to respond because that's your pipeline of talent. But I'd say reach out to your networks, speak to people. And I guess a closing point given the earlier question, um, again, mentioned be my mentor was dissension is not disloyalty. A good board meeting is a discussion, is a debate, not a series of presentations. So the culture is critical where you can have that level of discussion, that level of debate, and that level of dissension. We don't need to precursor it with the word constructive. We should be honest enough and open enough to deal with it and not cuddly fight it with the word constructive. Just be honest and direct. Thank you. And I think that, you know, I've been very struck by how much, how many similarities there are. And that is certainly one of them, isn't it, between being on different boards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daoshan. Thank you, Gurpreet, Sarah and Jane for being a brilliant panel. I feel like we could talk for ages more, which I think is always a sign of a good panel when we haven't got tumbleweeds skirting across the floor, scraping around for questions. So thank you all very much. Thank you, attendees, for making the, uh, the chat very active as well. Um, I'm going to explain how the breakouts are going to work for anybody that's staying, but for anybody else, thank you very much for coming and see you at other Getting On Board events.